topics on universal spiritual themes that are at the heart of all the great religious systems of the world. I don't talk about religion, but I talk about spirituality, the path of the heart. But I also, starting in the late 90s, when I wrote a book called Healing the Soul of America, I have throughout my career talked about political topics within the larger context of the path of the heart. And I ha feel that I have worked up close and personal with people who were navigating the consequences in their lives of the damage that has been done by what I have seen to be an irresponsible political establishment. Now, I'm 66 years old, so I have memories, as I know all of you do, when things in America were very different. And some of the ways that things in America were very different are where I want to start with you today. I know that you probably feel as I do, it's kind of counterintuitive. But the older I get, it's almost like the more I care. It's interesting because you feel on one level like, you know, I'm not going to be here that much longer. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make it out before the catastrophe comes. But that's not where you really go inside yourself, is it? Because I remember when I turned 50 and someone said 50 is the age past which you don't care what anyone thinks, what anyone else thinks anymore. And then when I turned 60, I felt like it's not just that I don't care what anybody thinks about what I say, I have to say it. And that's what I feel age, in my experience, has given me. I'm going to say what I think. And when it comes to this president and when it comes to the, so much of what is going on in this country, I feel the spirit of my dead father in my ear saying, this must not, not go unanswered. So Donald Trump is going to do what Donald Trump is going to do, but not without hearing from me. And that's why I'm running for president. <laughs> when we were young, it was considered the social contract in America that the corporation had a responsibility, an ethical responsibility, and a moral responsibility to all stakeholders. The corporation was considered ethically responsible to the workers, to the community, to the environment, to all of the various stakeholders in what happened in corporate America. Starting in the 1980s, this country bought into an economic theory where theoretically the only responsibility of the corporation is its financial responsibility to the stockholders. And that was often at the expense of the workers, at the expense of the environment, and at the expense of the community. This has so damaged our country. This has been going on for 40 years. It is an economic theory which promoted, we all know this, the trickle-down economic theory that promoted the idea that if our economic system was run along the line of allowing unfettered market forces without any kind of ethical responsibility to anyone other than the, the, the money that was owed to stockholders would order our society, that that was somehow good for us. And the propaganda was that then the money would trickle down and it would lift all boats. Well, I think after 40 years, the jury is in. After 40 years, I think we can say the evidence is in. This is not only not lifted all boats, it has left millions of people, millions, ladies and gentlemen, 40% of all Americans struggle just to make ends meet. It has left millions of people without even a life vest. It has destroyed America's middle class. It has created wealth inequality in this country that is the largest it's been in 100 years. And there is a lot of human despair behind those hard facts. 
we have so many people in this country. When you have 40% of people who, can, who have to struggle every month to make ends meet, we have many people who do not know how they will retire in dignity. We have 41 million people who are hungry in this country. We have 62% of Americans who cannot call themselves middle class. Now, on the other hand, you have, not on the other hand, really, it's on the same hand, you have so much depression, you have so much anxiety, you have so much drug addiction, you have so much suicide, you have so many at-risk and traumatized children, you have so many people who are living in chronic economic despair. And I look at this economic system that has squeezed so many millions of people that has left so many people taken away their jobs, taken away their factories, taken away their dignity, taken away their easy access to education, taken away their easy access to, to uh, health care. And then I look at all of these pathologies and the addiction and the depression and the shootings and the violence and the white nationalism, which are all the kinds of pathologies that are inevitable inevitable when you have that level of economic despair in, among a lot of people. And I think, what did you geniuses, all these self-satisfied politicians who created all this, and I think to myself, what did you geniuses think was going to happen? And I do not think that that system deserves one more year of this. And I do not believe that just a better version of the same old, same old is the answer. I don't believe that, that you know, we're, we're living in a time where only those whose entire mindset for decades have had a professional political career entrenched in the very system whose limitations create what I just described, and we're told that they are the only people that we should consider qualified to get us out of this ditch. I'm sorry. The, 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 the idea that only the group that got us into this ditch could, should be considered qualified enough to get us out of the ditch. This is how the American people have been played for fools. And we've been playing for fools for about 40 years now, and I think it's time for the American people to do what the greatest generation of Americans do when we are confronted with forces that honestly do harm to our democracy and do harm to our people. And that is, we say, that stops right now. I believe that the American people need to stage an intervention. And I think that that's what the American people wanted to do in, in, in four years ago, two years ago now. I think in the 2016 election, people wanted change. And I personally, with all due respect to anyone here who might have voted for Donald Trump, I don't think they got a change agent except in the worst possible way. But I think many people who voted for him thought it would be a change agent in a good way. I personally think he's the opposite of change agent in a positive way. But I think that the desire for change was valid. And I think that desire for change remains valid. And I don't think just going back to a better version of that same system is the answer. So I want to talk to you about three different issues that I feel are necessary in order for us to have a moral and a spiritual awakening in this country. Because what's happened is we've deviated from our moral values. Treating people the way I just said, making it so hard for millions of people to have health care, making it so hard for millions of people to know how they're going to pay for their kids' education, making it so hard for millions of people to be able to pay back their college loans, making it so hard for millions of people to retire with dignity, and while at the same time we don't have common sense gun laws because, God forbid, it should cut into the profit maximization of gun manufacturers, we don't fight climate change the way we should because, God forbid, it should cut into the profits of fossil fuel companies. We don't have universal health care because, God forbid, it should cut into the profits of health care, health insurance companies and uh, big pharma. And we don't actually wage peace. All we do is prepare for war because, God forbid, it should cut into the profits of defense manufacturers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a covert corporate takeover of the U.S. government. This is an overt corporate takeover of the U.S. government. And those of you, those of us, those of us who are old enough to know we're going to say it regardless what you think of us, I think it is the job of our generation to say it out loud. What we all know is true. 
this country is reverting to an aristocratic system. That's what the aristocracy was that this country set out to replace in 1776. We learned about it when we were kids. That in Europe, only a few people could own land, and only a few people uh, could own wealth, and only a few people could get an education, and everybody else was basically a serf to them. We repudiated that in 1776, and we need to repudiate it again. And to me, that's what we, when we were young, that's what we were doing. Somebody said to me, some young man said to me a couple years ago, he said, Miss Williamson, you're just an aging hippie. He said, all you did, you know, you're, all you did was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And my response to him was, that was just part of the day. <laughs> I said, the rest of the day, we stopped a war. And the implication, what were you doing, young man, was absolutely there. We were, we were talking about spiritual. I remember reading Alan Watts' books and Ram Dass' books in the morning and then going to anti-war protests in the afternoon. And we were audacious. And we were audacious in the same way that I think we need to be audacious again. There are millions of American children who go to school every single day in schools that don't even meet safety minimum safety requirements, and in schools that do not even have the adequate school supplies to teach a child to read. This is in the richest country in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be very clear here. Millions of American children who go to school every day in classrooms where they do not even have the minimum school supplies to teach a child to read. If a child cannot read, by the age of eight, the chances of that child graduating from high school are drastically diminished. And the chances of that child being incarcerated someday are drastically increased. Millions of these children, ladies and gentlemen, live in what's called today our domestic war zones where the violence in their homes, on their streets, in their communities, in their schools is so great that psychologists say they are living with a PTSD that is no less severe than the PTSD that is experienced by a veteran who is returning from Iraq or Afghanistan. And with a, a returning veteran, it is post-traumatic stress. With these children, it's present traumatic stress. Now, would we and should we not see this as a national humanitarian crisis? Should we not be rescuing these children no differently than we were rescuing them from a natural disaster? No. Uh-uh. We're just normalizing their despair. And why? Well, they're not old enough to vote, so they're not a constituency. And they're not old enough to work, so there's no financial leverage. And in a government such as ours, which, ladies and gentlemen, has become little more because of the undue influence of money on our system, especially since the Citizens United case, so much money floods our system as to make our government little more than a system of legalized bribery. What possible chance do these children have to compete with the clout of all the corporate money that floods our Congress and our White House? This is immoral. This is wrong. This is not what America is supposed to stand for. And if I'm president, we will have a United States cabinet-level department of children and youth. What we have, and I see it everywhere I go, in every state, because these kids are in every state, ladies and gentlemen, they're in Iowa too. And I meet people everywhere I go. We have the psychologists, we have the early childhood educators and uh, mental health experts, we have the people who are social workers and teachers, we have the people to provide the what's called today wraparound services, anti-trauma, restorative this justice, is what it will sound like when conflict with resolution. Maps. 
We could do mindfulness in schools. We have so much we could do to help these children. But these people who could help these children are getting maybe a $50,000 grant from the government, or they're doing a fundraiser to raise $100,000, while our government is giving literally billions of dollars in tax breaks and in subsidies to the very institutions and industries who have been getting all this money over the last 40 years that has then been causing this squeeze out of which all this dysfunction arises. Now, who is going to say this needs to stop if not a woman who is old enough to know better? And I'm not the only person running who's old enough to know better. But I do think there's something about being old enough to know better that makes you fearless in your willingness to just say it like it is. The other issue that I think we need to talk about is our national security. I have great respect for the military. I think we should have great respect for the military. My father fought in World War II. The problem I have with our national security agenda is not the fault of the military. It's the fault of politicians who make these decisions, which just like in every other area we're talking about, are based more on creating profits for corporate entities than for advocating for people. You can't just take medicine. Can you? you have to cultivate peace, excuse me, health. You have to proactively cultivate your health. You can't just wait to get sick and take medicine. And we can't just back ourselves into peace. We can't just prepare for war in the 21st century. We have to wage peace. Donald Rumsfeld is the Department of Defense Secretary for George Bush. He said we have to wage peace. General Mattis, before he left the Defense Department, said if you're not going to fully fund the State Department, I'm going to have to buy more ammunition. So how do you create peace? I'll tell you, it's not going to shock you. And then I'm going to tell you four things. That when they are present, statistically, the evidence is in, peace is greater, and violence is reduced. Number one, big shock, expand economic opportunities for women. Number two, expand educational opportunities for children. Number three, reduce violence against women. And number four, diminish human suffering wherever possible. We should see large groups of desperate people as a national security risk. Large groups of desperate people are more vulnerable to ideological capture by genuinely psychotic forces. That's true if it's desperate people in a corner of a city whose kids turn it, go to gangs. It's true of a desperate people desperate in a corner of the world that become captured by terrorist organizations. And it's even true in the United States of America when people become captured by the ideology of white nationalism or an authoritarian demagogue. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. You and I will probably leave this planet before this whole thing falls apart. But I'm telling you something. The direction we're going, it will fall apart. This is not something that can continue. This is a peril to our democracy. We have children. We have grandchildren. And it's not an accident that in ancient tribes, before the young men went to war, they went and asked the grandmothers for permission. Because in ancient tribes it was understood that it was the elders who had the wisdom to know what is really going on and what should happen. We are not functioning as a democracy. We're functioning now as a veiled aristocracy, where only a few people are entitled easy to health care, only a few people have easy access to education, where millions of people don't know how they will take their, send their kids to college, they don't know what they'll do if they get sick, they don't know what they will do if one of their kids gets sick, they don't know what they will do 
to pay off their college loans were a very, very small group of people. 1% of all Americans control 90% of the wealth in this country. They own as much as 90% of the wealth in this country. Now, I'm a capitalist, but I believe in capitalism with a conscience. Capitalism is very good at, at creating economic opportunity, but it doesn't necessarily take care of everybody. Socialism is very good at taking care of everybody, but not very good at creating economic opportunity. And we have now, this is an important moment. You have these really big billionaire capitalist leaders like Jeremy Grantham and uh, Ray Dalio. There are some people who represent the most successful capitalist leaders today who realize this thing's gone out of control. And where things are now is unsustainable. And if they don't bring it back to an ethical center, they will create their own repudiation. We already have a generation of young people who are like, what has global capitalism ever done for me? And they have a, they have a legitimate point. So we have to course correct in this nation. And we need to do it now. And we've done it before. We answered slavery with abolition. We answered the suppression of women with the women's suffragette movement. We answered white supremacy and segregation in the United States with the civil rights movement. And it's our turn. And I don't know about you, but I feel that, I don't know, it's something about being over 60. It's like, this is, this is the time to say it like it is. We need a fierce and honest and real conversation about what's going on in this country. And the traditional politicians, God bless them, and this is nothing personal, but it's all talking about the symptoms and not naming the cause. Watering the leaves, but not watering the roots. I'm too old for that. I think we need to have a very real conversation in America about what's really happening. And then we can change, and then we can have breakthroughs. The Catholics go to confession. The Jews have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you have to admit the exact nature of your wrongs. Take a fearless moral inventory. America needs to take a fearless moral inventory. These millions of children, these millions of children who are suffering in our midst, the fact that we, we have an entire economy based on preparing for war and not waging peace, when we have created such horrifying military disasters in Iraq and in Vietnam and elsewhere. We are not addressing the deep racial problems in our country from mass incarceration to racial disparity in our criminal sentencing, etc. I've worked for 35 years in helping people change their lives. The first thing you have to do is get real. The first thing you have to do is get honest. And then I believe God's universe is merciful. And when you do atone, and you do make amends, and you do change, breakthroughs happen, and everything begins again at a higher place, we can have that in this country. But only if we get real. And that's what I'm trying to do with this campaign, and that's what I will do if I'm president of the United States. Americans are going to stop pretending to be one thing, while in too many ways we're acting in another way. And when we do do that, this country's going to change. And then, then, we will be great. Thank you. questions or any comments, I would love to hear your thoughts about what you think is true in our country and how you feel that I could best address those things and any questions you have. Yes, sir. Um, well, how do you feel you could best address? I mean, if, if you're president, what kind of policies, what kind of actions, things Great. like that? Great. Thank you. Take? First of all, we need an immediate infusion of economic hope. So first thing you do, we need universal health care and Medicare for all type plan. When you look at how much of people's money every month and every year goes into health care, that immediately puts more money in people's pockets. Not only do I want health care because of the financial, but health care is too complicated in America. It fritters away everybody's life force. It should be very simple. You have an econo a, a, fin a, a medical need then you simply get taken care of with a Medicare for all type system. But also for our health, we need to address all the environmental toxins, all the chemical toxins that's allowed in our food, in our water, 
There are many, many policies. Our food policies, our farming policies, our agricultural policies, our factory farming policies. There are many ways that we actually contribute to our having chronic illnesses in this country. There are many ways that we could have an, a, a health care system. In many ways, our health care system is not a health care system. It's a sickness care system. So we, there are so many things we could do to actually invest in ways to prevent illness and help us live a healthier life to begin with. I want to lift the, uh, the um, uh, minimum wage to $15 an hour. They're, they talk about how they're creating so many jobs. They're creating so many jobs. So many of them are very low-paying jobs without benefits that people need to work two or three jobs just to put food on their table. And this is millions of people in America. Let's lift the minimum wage to $15 an hour, although I th there are places in America where that would be a very, it would be too big a leap. And so I think that government compensating, at least temporarily, does make sense. We could cancel the majority of these college loans, take the burden off the back of these kids. It is outrageous. There's a trillion and a half college loan debt in America. How can somebody soar? This is where money comes from. When people can, can express themselves and produce and be creative and do the great things they want to do. But we cap people's dreams today. I want young people to feel we're investing in you. We're going to give you the health care you need. We're going to give you the education you need. I want, you're going to have a free education so that you can, you can be all that you can be. And then in exchange for that, I want you to be the man or the woman that you're capable of being. That's how America soars. So we need an immediate infusion of economic hope and opportunity. I want to repeal those, that $2 trillion tax cut in 2017. $2 trillion in tax cuts and 83 cents of every dollar went to the very richest people and the very richest corporations. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't building our economy. This has nothing. Look at, look at what's done for the last 40 years. So what, what do you think? It's going gonna, it's gonna to improve the economy in 10 years? No. If you want a better economy 10 years from now, what you do is you take better care of your 10-year-olds today. And that's why I want to, uh, to have that cabinet level U.S. Department of Children and Youth so that we can coordinate ways that we can help these children. Do you realize that the child sex trafficking industry in the United States is a $91 billion a year industry? And it has infused, uh, sex trafficking, $91 billion. And it has infused our foster care system. And the biggest, you know what the biggest sex, uh, child sex trafficking event in the world is? The Super Bowl. Now this is the level of deep rot that we have that we need to address and stop ignoring. The other thing I would do in terms of waging of what I talked before about national security agenda, Right now, for every dollar that we spend on peace creation in the things that I was telling you about, we spend over $1,000 in ways to prepare for war. So I want a far more robust, what we've been doing is cutting, that's what the State Department's supposed to be, humanitarian and diplomatic efforts. We routinely cut those, and we routinely keep adding to the military expenditure way beyond what the military is even asking for. So, as a consequence, what I would do is I would bring them into robust partnership, far more equal resources, and also because we need so much of this to address so much of the conflict on our own streets, we need a United States Department of Peace as well. Because the, the State Department addresses issues of international peace, and a U.S. Uh, Department of Peace would, create, uh, would discuss these issues on a personal level, on a domestic level. Also. I don't believe the average American is a racist, but I do believe the average American is vastly undereducated about the history of race in the United States. Uh, everyone in this room remembers the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, when the Civil War was over in 1865, there were four to five million slaves in the United States, and Tecumseh Sherman uh, told every former slave family of four that they could have 40 acres and a mule, which would have given a former slave population the opportunity to reintegrate into a free economic situation. I think we'd all agree if you kick somebody to the ground, two and a half centuries of slavery is certainly kicking people to the ground. 
if you kick somebody to the ground, you have a moral responsibility, number one, to stop kicking, and number two, to say, here, let me help you get back up. Did that ever become policy? No, it did not. What became policy instead, and I think if Lincoln had lived, things would have been different. But rather, the 40 acres and a mule that was promised, in most cases, was not given. And even in the cases where it was given, it was made, usually get taken back. Mm -hmm. And when the federal troops left the South in 1877, because the government sent federal troops to the South to ensure that slavery would not be reinstituted. So between 1865 and 1877, the federal troops were there. As soon as the federal troops left, southern legislatures throughout the South passed what were called Black Code Laws. And Black Code Laws ensured subpar economic and political and social opportunities for black people. What followed then from 1865 to 1965, 100 years, is what we would call today an era of domestic terrorism. What would you call lynchings if not domestic terrorism? What would you call the Ku Klux Klan if not domestic terrorism? By 1900, you had full-on institutionalized white supremacy and segregation where you could go, where you could eat, where you could sit, where you could work, what you could have. And that was not addressed till the Civil Rights Movement. We remember, 1964, we passed the Civil Rights Act, which dismantled segregation. 1965, the Voting Rights Act, that gave equal voting rights to black people. But ladies and gentlemen, in 2013, John Roberts led Supreme Court started chipping away at the Voting Rights Act. And as soon as they did, all these voter suppression efforts started throughout this country. So in many ways, we're sliding back. We're sliding backwards. Mass incarceration, when it comes to race relations, mass incarceration means we're sliding backwards. Racial disparity in criminal sentencing things means we're sliding backwards. We are good people. I believe in the American people, and Americans have a good sense of justice and fair play. Now, Germany has paid $89 billion in reparations to Jewish organizations since World War II. Now, that can't make the Holocaust not have happened, but I think those reparations have been a big part of achieving reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Germany and the rest of Europe. We, I believe, because we've never addressed in any fundamental way the issue of economic restitution for two and a half centuries of slavery, plus another hundred years of, what, of that institutionalized white supremacy, I believe we should pay reparations for slavery. It, will never, it won't mean that slavery didn't happen. But there is an underlying tension and anxiety. It's counterintuitive. Because we all remember times when things were much worse about race, that in a way, I don't know, it's bad again. But it's more underneath. And I believe it would be great, a great gift to our children and our children's children if we paid reparations. These are the kinds of bold moves, not incremental moves, but bold policy moves that will actually interrupt a very dysfunctional and even pathological trajectory of American history at this time. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Well, how do you break the cycle of legalized bribery? Well, because, okay, because of the current makeup of the Supreme Court, it doesn't look like we are going to be overturning Citizens United anytime soon. The House, the current House of Representatives has passed H.R. 1. It's called the Democracy Act or something, of the People Act, something like that, for the People Act. And it's a very important bill. What it does, number one, get rid of this gerrymandering that we have now. It would have independent commissions that draw the district lines, because right now what we have is, is, is people in Congress who are picking their constituents rather than constituents picking the people in Congress. 
we should make voting much easier for people. Voting should be automatic on somebody's 18th birthday. Voting should be a national holiday. So none of this that we're talking about here today is going to happen, including if, there's, if the Russians or whomever is back at it in 2020. There's only one guarantee that we can override any of this, and this is if there's massive voting on the part of the American people. So right now, when you talk about that legalized system of, of bribery, a woman named Janet Mayer wrote a book called Dark Money. A woman named Nancy McLean wrote a book called Democracy in Chains. Our democracy is under assault. It is absolutely, democracy itself is under assault. Because you take everything that I just mentioned, and you add to that the voting suppression efforts. So what we need is a massive uprising of the American people. That's the only thing that's going to do it, sir, is if we wake up Cynicism is just an excuse for not helping. Whining is not an option. And I hope with this campaign, I hope that my, my campaign is in its own way an agent of awakening. That's the only thing that is going to make this change. Because we're not going to be overturning Citizens United. Now, there are state efforts. You know, there are a lot of state efforts, various places that are uh, working on, against dark money. But... It, it really, it's up to us now. It's really up to us now. Make sense? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I think that uh, it's, it's not um, brought to the attention of the public enough, and I hope you'll do this, the kind of lack of education that climate change and immigration are having on each other. So I'm wondering if how you want to present this, that we've gotten out of the, the only country in the world that's out, first world country that's out of the climate change accord. We're cutting off funds to Central America. And we are going to have millions of people coming from South America trying to come into our borders as the country becomes hotter and hotter, droughts happen, more violence. And I think that the climate change emphasis has been on um, our own country and our own world in terms of deforestation, wildfires, earthquakes. But I think the, there's going to be mass immigration refugees because of this. So this lady is talking about the relationship between climate change and immigration. And I think you're right, not everybody sort of put those dots together the way they should be, and you're absolutely correct. What this lady is saying is, and you're absolutely correct, in that it is now believed that if we do not get on top of this climate change issue, that because of droughts, etc., we could have over the next few years 200 million climate change refugees. So the idea here is, why are these people refugees? Well, we think of many things that make people leave their homes and try to escape and go somewhere better. One, economic despair, and that's certainly true in, in South America. One, violence, and that's certainly true in South America. But what she's saying is true, and it's true not only in South America but elsewhere. One of the reasons people are in economic despair, et cetera, is because of the droughts, et cetera, so that they, they can't farm their land anymore. They can't, they, they can't, they, you know, they, they, they are unable to make a living and to live their lives in the, in the conditions created by climate change. And, of course, if we do not do something fundamental within the next 12 years, then scientists tell us that the situation will be beyond repair. If I am president, we will have a world-class envi uh, environmentalist, not an ex-chemical company exec or an ex-oil company exec, at the head of the Environmental Protection Agency. Of course, we will get back in the Paris Accords, and the entire uh, Environmental Protection Agency will become what it should be. It will be a font for the most world-class environmental scientists and sustainability experts, and the people who are working there will know that the full force of the executive branch of the U.S. government and the president herself will be fully behind their efforts to treat this as the crisis that it is. This is not just climate change. This is climate crisis. And 
we are already seeing all of the effects of this increasing problem. Uh, we need a carbon tax. We need that carbon sequestration. We need reforestation. We need to deal with the issues of factory farming. We need to deal with the runoffs. We need to develop clean energy. And we need to do it quickly. That's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. We have done that in this country. You and I remember. And we don't remember necessarily World War II, but our parents told us the stories about World War II. When this country needs to rev up and handle an issue, this country knows how to handle an issue. We're like this now. Well, maybe we can change it a little bit over here. Maybe we can change it a little bit over there. Who have we become? No, we got a big problem on our hands. And historically, America's got a problem on our hands. We can handle it. And that's how we need to treat climate change right now. And you're right. And unfortunately, when you were talking about uh, the climate change in, in South America, I think the United States also has to take some deep looking at our foreign policies in late Latin America over the last few decades. Because in Latin America, as in so many places, we are not seen as great champions of democracy. We have been more champions of the profits of, of, our, of our multinational corporations and American corporations based in these countries than we have been of, of, of actual democratic. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being here. And that's what's created, of course, a lot of the economic despair. This is what I mean. America has to look at our own shadows, right? That's what happens when an individual goes to therapy and an individual tries to change. We have to get honest and real. That's what Trump is for. Pardon? I said that's what Trump is for. You mean in that to show us to ourselves in a certain way? Yeah. Yes. Anybody else in the other topic? Yes, sir. Ms. Mayor, I suspect you're aware of the situation uh, involving the Israelis and the Palestinians. Yes. And uh, you know the United States has uh, 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 proclaimed itself an honest broker there for years and years and years. It's been a long time since we've been an honest broker, and, hasn't uh, it? Uh, everything that's been tried to bring some justice to Palestinians has fallen flat. I wonder uh, how would you approach that in a different way so that uh, uh, the Palestinians could uh, get their get their justice and uh, uh, and not have their children being shot uh, by snipers and not having themselves evacuated from their homes, not having settlers come into their area and build houses and roads that they can't use. So I wonder how would you be different. <coughs> First of all, I want to take on the issue of the honest broker. It has been a long time. And I would work very hard to be a president of the United States where both Palestinian and Israeli leaders felt heard by me. You have a situation where we have to be profoundly committed to two different things. Number one, appropriate security concerns of Israel, which is our ally, and the human rights of the Palestinians. You have two peoples who are living conflicting historical narratives on the same piece of land. And many of the solutions that need to occur will not, at this point, be only on the level of external change, but will be on the level of the heart. I believe the United States should be very definitely an ally for the security of Israel, and I believe Israel is going to have to start treating the Palestinians better. I believe that when territory is occupied, that you owe it to the residents of the occupied territory, that the resources of that land are used for them. I do not agree with the blockade in Gaza. I, do, I believe that these settlements are illegal. The last U.S. president that came out and said that they were illegal was Jimmy Carter. And I believe as much as it is important that we, for instance, uh, Trump, actually affirming recently in a very illegal, irresponsible way 
affirming sovereignty of Israel over the Golan Heights? Israel does not have sovereignty over the Golan Heights. When you occupy territory, that does not give you the right to annex that territory. Now, Israel occupying the Golan Heights for now is legitimate until there is a, demo a stable democratic government in Syria. But that has nothing to do with the United States uh, uh, seeing sovereignty or suggesting that annexation is okay. There is a, an election going on in Israel today. And unfortunately, supported by our president, they have been moving in a direction which is away from real peace. And as president of the United States, while my commitment to the existence of Israel, I believe Israel has a right to exist, and my commitment to our, our, um, our alliance with them is very strong, the United States also must be, you know, our Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. And that does not only mean all Americans are created equal. And at this point, the human rights abuses of the Palestinians uh, needs to be, the United States needs to be, at the same time, we have to be absolutely committed to both. And as President of the United States, the, is, the Palestinian leadership would know that my commitment is absolutely uh, airtight to their human rights, and yet not at the expense of the security of Israel. And my commitment to the security of Israel would be airtight, but not at the expense of my commitment to the human rights of the Palestinians. That is the only way that we will ever get back on the road to a two-state solution. And the United States cannot call for that, but the United States, I'll tell you something, sir. I'm president of the United States, both the leader of the Palestinian Authority, as well as the Prime Minister of Israel would know. They would have my number on speed dial, and I would say to both, you can call me any time day or night, I don't care what the hour, hour is, when you are ready to start those negotiations for a two-state solution, I am there, and the full power of the United States will be at your disposal for any way that we can help. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that for 35 years I have counseled couples is actually a skill set that I bring to this particular issue, because this is not just an issue of material, the best, the best minds have applied themselves to the issue of Israel and the Palestinians. The, the answer is not going to be only on the level of the Green Line, it's not going to be only on the level of the settlements, it's got to be somebody who can really hold the space for a deeper level of healing. And to be honest, my career has given me the kind of skill set that could be greatly helpful. Well, the, the United States can't control that. But the United States is extremely important. And the United States, you know, so much of what is going on right now, the attitude of the President of the United States, we have lost our moral leadership in the world. You know, the Dalai Lama himself said to me, people of the world no longer see America as a great champion of democracy. And it is terrible, whether it has to do with the arms sales to Saudi Arabia that now both the Senate and the House have told his president he has to stop, when we knew that those arms sales were contributing to the genocidal war of the, of the Saudi Arabians against Yemen. Tens of thousands of people starved, including so many children. Whether it has to do with Israel and Palestine or any other way, the United States absolutely must reclaim the moral authority that never, it, it, it was never there with the world looking at America and going, oh, they've got it all together. But there was a time when it was clear to the world that that was what we aspired to, that was what we stood on, and that's what we were serious about, and that's what we were going for. We have sacrificed our moral authority in the world. We have sacrificed our democratic values. We have sacrificed our, our moral leadership and our, our moral and humanitarian values here at home. That is the level on which these things must be addressed, and if I'm president, I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Folks, thank you so much. Uh, we've got sign-in sheets over there. We're, we're so grateful for one of you are here. Marianne's going to visit with some of you folks, uh, and uh, thank you again for coming up. We really appreciate it. Thank you.